Okay, today we are going to introduce biology, which is the study of life. As you can see from the slide, there are a variety of life forms out there. In the bottom middle in blue is DNA. First we're going to talk about the scientific method, then we're going to talk about some theories and the basic characteristics of life, and last we're going to talk about taxonomy, which is classification. So biology is the scientific study of life, Greek. It's Greek, bios is life, logia is the study of. The scientific method is how we gather factual information to explain the phenomena. The scientific method is very important because that is how we validate research. If you're going to do research, you need to write everything down, take careful notes, and be very accurate because your experiment has to be repeatable. So I have to be able to take your experiment do the same thing you did and get the exact same results that you did. So there's four basic steps. The first one is observation. Basically you have a question or you make an observation and you want to do some research and figure out why it's happening. You can either use past studies to help explain it, internet or library research of course, or it could be new. So there's no previous studies done on it and you're going to be the first one to do it. Second thing you do is have a hypothesis. A hypothesis is an educated guess. It's a tentative statement. Tentative means that it can change. So it's a statement that you're saying that you think is the case, but it might not be the case. Next step is your experiment or testing of your hypothesis. So you're going to gather new data which is factual information, of course, and these are your results. You're going to add to the body of knowledge with your results. You can either do a lab experiment, which is usually very controlled and can use models, or a field observation where you're going to collect descriptive data in the natural setting. Once you have your results, you're going to analyze them to come up with your conclusion. It's going to either support or not support your hypothesis. If it supports your hypothesis, usually you're going to publish your research in a journal so that everybody can have access to it. Again, your results must be repeatable or your research can't be validated. If it is not supported, you go back to your hypothesis and you modify it. <laughs> Inductive versus deductive reasoning. Inductive leads to you have an observation that is specific and you go to general. Deductive reasoning is the opposite. You have general and you go to specific. So we use an if-then logic. So deductive reasoning is like Sherlock Holmes used to do. He would say, you know, the criminal is a man, men have mustaches, and John has a mustache, so John's the criminal kind of thing. Inductive is the opposite. You have a specific observation and you generalize it. So inductive reasoning allows scientists to form hypotheses and theories based on the specific observation. Deductive reasoning helps us design experiments to test the hypotheses. So it allows us to apply theories to specific situations. So we need them both. Very importantly, you have two variables that are key to your lab investigations. The experimental variable is what's being manipulated. So the cause. It's also called the independent variable. So this is the thing that's being manipulated in the experiment and everything else is held constant. The responding variable is also called the dependent variable. This would be the effect. So this is the result or change that we're going to measure or observe and it's caused by the experimental variable. So the dependent variable depends on the independent variable. So the independent or experimental variable is what you're manipulating. The responding or dependent variable is what you're measuring or observing. 
Along with that, we have two groups, the control group and the test group. The control group is the group that goes through all of the steps of the experiment except for the experimental variable. So it's going to help validate the results by giving you something to compare your results to. The test group is the group that goes through all of the steps, including the experimental variable. So let's say we want to test a fertilizer, miracle Grow, we'll say. So we'll have a group of plants that doesn't get fertilizer and a group of plants that gets the miracle Grow. The group of plants that doesn't get the fertilizer is your control group. The group of plants that gets the fertilizer is your test group. So if your test group grows and your control group does not, you could attribute it to the miracle Grow. Another, if you want to test blood pressure medication, you have people in the control group that take a placebo, which is just a sugar pill basically, and then people that take the actual medication, which is your test group. If the blood pressure goes down in the test group but not the control group, you can attribute it to the pill. So the important thing is with your groups, you need to have a large enough sample size. The bigger the better. You cannot have two plants or two people and say that your results are valid. So larger groups, larger samples. So if you have three plants here, and again, it would be larger than just three plants. One of them doesn't get water. One of them gets water every day for 20 milliliters and one of them gets water every day that's 40 milliliters. So what do you think could be a possible hypothesis that we're testing here? So the amount of water that the plant receives will affect its growth. So basically we're testing if more water helps the plant grow more. So what's the experimental variable here? the amount of water. What is the responding variable? So what's the dependent variable? What's depending on the amount of water? Plants growth. So which group is the control group? Plant one, because it doesn't have any water. The test group two and three because they're getting water. So you also have to think about what other factors can affect a plant's growth because everything else you have to hold constant. So the amount of sunlight, the type of light, the soil type, pot size, fertilizer, type of water, type of plant, how old the plants are, a lot of things can affect plants growth so those all have to be controlled or standardized. So in a lot of ways science has improved our lives especially in the field of medicine. We've developed antibiotics, vaccines, treatments for cancer and genetic disorders so people can live a lot longer now than they used to live. However, we've had some concerns as well. Stem cell research, cloning, designer babies, gene farming, xenotransplantation, just to name a few. We're basically taking what we want from science and turning it into things we want to create that might not necessarily be good, I guess is the point. So science is impartial and basically tries to study the natural world. Science does not make moral or ethical decisions. People have the sole responsibility on how to use the knowledge so that we can benefit all living things. The enemy is not the science, it's the people who take that information and use it in bad ways, basically. Science is objective and phenomena that are subjective cannot be tested using the scientific method. So science is objective, meaning there's no bias in it. It can be measured, it is straightforward. No prejudice at all. Subjective means that there's prejudice or bias. Your personal views come into play. You cannot test those things using the scientific method. So morals, ethics, religious views, we cannot test those. 
Okay, so observation. You make an observation that you want to test. You form a hypothesis, and then you test your hypothesis. You look at your conclusion, you look at your results, you analyze them, and the hypothesis is either supported or rejected. If you use many experiments and observations and they all come back that they're supporting the hypothesis, it may become a theory. A scientific theory arises out of scientists using the scientific method. It's not actually a part of the scientific method. So after scientists use the scientific method and repeatedly support a hypothesis, that hypothesis may become a theory. So a theory is a scheme that's supported over years by a huge amount of research from scientists using the scientific method. We have the cell theory, the gene theory, homeostasis theory, the ecosystem theory, and of course the theory of evolution. So the cell theory states that all living things are composed of cells, that cells are the basic structural and fundamental unit of life, we have a hierarchy of cellular organization where cells will combine to form tissues, tissues will combine to form organs, organs combine to form organ systems, which of course organ systems combine to form the organism. Organisms will form populations. So a population is a group of the same species. Populations then form communities. Communities are groups of different species. So if you're sitting in a room with a bunch of other people, like a class for example, and there's no other living organisms in there, you are a population. Once you go outside and you're around grass and trees and bugs, you're in a community. Communities form ecosystems because ecosystems take into account the abiotic factors or non-living factors like temperature, precipitation, wind, that kind of stuff. And then of course we have the biosphere which is the planet. It all starts, which we're going to talk about in chapter 2, with atoms and molecules. Those are non-living things, but atoms will combine to form molecules and molecules will form cells. So they're part of cells, but they're not actually living. And here is your hierarchy again, with pictures. So again, chemistry is going to be molecules and atoms. Then we're going to move to the cell, and we're going to study cellular structures and functions. And then we're going to study, if you take the second semester, the organism structure and functions and the interactions among the organisms and their environment, which is known as ecology. So cells reproduce and come from pre-existing cells. A cell isn't going to spontaneously just appear. Reproduction perpetuates the species by both asexual and sexual means. Asexually speaking, one organism simply splits into two. The offspring are genetically identical to the parent cell, and unicellular organisms like bacteria usually use this method of reproduction. Sexual, you need two parents it's the union of sex cells, the sperm and the egg. The offspring goes sta undergoes stages of development to become an adult. The offspring are not genetically identical to the parents, and multicellular organisms reproduce this way. Living cells also undergo metabolism. Metabolism are all of the chemical reactions that are happening in your body, and this is how we convert nutrients, which food that we take in into energy that we can use. Energy is the capacity to do work, but we need energy for everything in our lives. We need energy to maintain our organization, to reproduce, to respond to stimuli, also to grow and repair tissues and other things in our bodies. The sun is the ultimate source of all energy for plants and animals. Photosynthesis is the process that plants use. They transform solar energy into chemical energy, and then consumers can 
use that energy once they consume the plants. So plants are called autotrophs. They are the producers of the food chain. They're self-feeders, meaning they make their own food. Animals are the heterotrophs, so they ingest or absorb the consumers. And at the bottom there, there's a little video on the Doomsday Vault that you can watch. Make sure you're in slideshow mode in order to watch it, or you won't be able to see it. Genes are the basic unit of heredity. This is the gene theory. DNA is the spiral double helix molecule that contains the genes. And genes basically make us who we are. They control our form and function of all the cells and organisms. Mutations are permanent changes in our DNA structure. And proteins are made of amino acids that code for particular products. So our DNA basically makes us who we are. It dictates what proteins we will make. And if a mutation occurs, that's a permanent change in our structure. So there's a gene right there on the bottom. You can see the DNA double helix. That codes for a protein that contributes to form and function somehow. For example, melanin. Melanin is a protein that contributes to our skin tone, so it makes us the color that we are. It also helps prevent UV damage. However, if you go out in the sun, you can damage your DNA and you can get skin cancer. If your gene itself mutates, it can lead to albinism, which is where you have no color at all. So we can apply this in genetic research and medicine and also determine relatedness, basically. The theory of homeostasis basically just says that we have this happy, steady internal state and we want to maintain that. It's in a fairly constant range, but it's usually in a pretty narrow range. So homeostasis itself is the maintenance of those internal conditions within those ranges. Feedback is how we help us maintain this homeostasis. It's involuntary and the nervous and endocrine systems are in charge. Negative feedback mechanisms are almost everything in our body, but they reverse the initial condition. So if we get hot, for example, we'll sweat to cool down. If we get cold, will shiver to warm up. Positive feedback actually intensifies the condition and the only two real examples we have in our body are childbirth and blood clotting. So with childbirth, the baby's head is pushing on the cervix causing the release of a hormone called oxytocin. Oxytocin causes uterine contractions. More oxytocin, stronger uterine contractions. So the baby's head pushing against the cervix causes more oxytocin to be released and stronger uterine contractions. So everything is intensified. All the way up until the baby is born, the stimulus is gone. Behaviors are our responses to stimuli. They also help regulate internal conditions. For example, if you put a plant by a window, their leaves will actually move and grow towards the sunlight. Reptiles sunbathe if they are cold, look for shade if they are hot. So examples of internal factors that have to be maintained, blood pressure, water, temperature, pH, glucose, there's a lot of them. So what happens when your body fails to maintain homeostasis? It leads to illness. It can be mild or severe and it can actually lead to death. Hyper and hypothermia are when you get too hot or too cold. Hyper or hypoglycemia is when your blood sugar gets too high or too low. Dehydration, you do not have enough water. Hyper or hypotension, your blood pressure is too high or too low. Diabetic ketoacidosis can lead to a coma, but that happens, that messes up your pH. The theory of ecosystems. All living things, which are biotic, interact with each other and with their non-living, which is abiotic environment. So you have, again, individual organisms make up a population, which populations make up communities, 
community makes up the ecosystem which takes into account the abiotic factors, so wind, temperature, precipitation, and all of that leads to the biosphere. So we have your biotic components, which are your producers, consumers, and decomposers. And we have your abiotic components, like precipitation, soil type, light, temperature. Abiotic factors determine the type of ecosystem that you live in. So desert versus the tundra versus the forest, for example. Ecosystems that have high biodiversity, which biodiversity means they have a high amount of different species. For aquatic, it's the coral reefs. And for terrestrial or on land, it's the tropical rainforest. These have the highest biodiversity on the planet. And unfortunately, both of these are in danger. We are starting to destroy our coral reefs and we are starting to destroy our tropical rainforests. We have cut down about a third of our tropical rainforests to build things. Luckily, there are people trying to reverse this. There's a guy that actually grows coral reefs and then goes out deep sea diving to re-implant them. And countries like Costa Rica are doing something called eco-tours where they take individuals on tours of the tropical rainforest to try and show their government that they're worthwhile and that we sh they should keep them. So ecosystems are characterized, they have a constant input of energy, they are very efficient at chemical cycling, and they have intricate food chains or food webs. Food webs are where species are interconnected and you, they can interact at multiple levels. So something can eat something else, but also be eaten by something else. So as you can see on the left hand side, or the right hand side here, we have solar energy coming in, because that's the ultimate source, to the producers. The producers will then create energy, transform it into chemical energy, which the consumers will eat. The decomposers will break everything down and recycle nutrients. An important thing here to notice is that heat is lost at every level. So every level is less efficient than the one before it. So it's actually more efficient to be a herbivore or a vegetarian than it is to be a carnivore or a meat eater. So the impact of human populations, of course, we have a lot of impact. We are not hunter and gatherers anymore. We are more industrialized. So we keep cutting things down to build new stuff. So how do we impact our natural ecosystems as it relates to energy? Do we have a positive, negative, or neutral effect? Well, of course, we have a negative effect because we have increased demands, so we have to develop new ways to get this energy. So we're looking at sustainable, renewable energy. Renewable energy like the sun, water power, biomass energy, geothermal energy, wind energy. You see turbines all over the place trying to utilize that wind energy. There's non-renewable energy like the fossil fuels that we burn, nuclear energy and coal. So we need to figure out ways that we can conserve energy and create energy from the renewable sources of energy that we have an endless supply of. Oil spills have unfortunately hurt a lot of animals. There was, there have been quite a few big oil spills and they're very difficult to clean up. And that's a huge problem. So, efficiency of chemical cycling, how do we impact our ecosystems? Well, pollutants are going to decrease that efficiency because we are adding all of this pollution to all of the ecosystems, both air, land, and water. So we keep adding pollution and that decreases the efficiency of these natural ecosystems. So we should reduce, reuse, and recycle, or go green as they say. We really need to make sure that we recycle everything we possibly can, reduce waste, Something as simple as turning off the water when you're brushing your teeth can actually save a lot of water. 
wash your clothes in cold water, for example. And how do we impact our ecosystems as it relates to the biodiversity within the food webs? We decrease the biodiversity because we are taking everything down and building stuff. So organisms are losing their habitat. We are introducing non-natives to areas so they're taking over and becoming invasive species so that our native plants can no longer grow. We are over hunting as well. Deforestation is when you chop down trees to build things and we are doing that a lot. So what we need to do is stop, but it's very difficult to get the people responsible to stop. And then we have the theory of evolution. Basically, organisms share a common ancestor, so they have shared characteristic. The definition of evolution is gradual change over time. So over time, you're going to see changes in species behavior because of gene changes. A mutation, again, is a change in the DNA, a change in the gene structure. And it's going to lead to a change in a form and a function. If the change is beneficial, it's going to be an adaptation. It can be caused by the environment or spontaneous. And species have to adapt to their environments or they don't survive. So an adaptation is a physical or behavioral change that makes the organism better suited to survive in their environment. Evolution, again, are genetic changes when the species over time. This is what's associated with Darwin's descent with modification. Basically, you are descendants and you are modified to fit your environment because our environment today is not the same as it was years ago. So evolution leads to survival of the fittest. But by survival of the fittest, we're not saying that just because you're in the best shape, you're going to survive. What survival of the fittest really means is survival of the fittest in that environment. So the most fit are going to be best adapted to meet their needs and produce more offspring. But again, it's to that environment. Modifications occur through natural selection. So natural selection basically is a process where if you are successful at producing offspring, your genes are going to be the ones passed on. So they're going to be selected. Some organisms share similar characteristics and that infers common ancestry. At the bottom there we have a cladogram which kind of shows when new traits popped up and the animals and organisms that had those traits and we will talk more about that at a later date. So evolution is the unifying concept in biology and this actually explains the unity and the diversity of life. <clears throat> so you have unity because there's a common ancestor. We have change over time which is evolution descent with modification, so modifications which lead to the diversity. So the past is our unity, the present is the diversity. So what makes something alive? We have seven characteristics of life that are present in all organisms. Life is organized from the cell to the biosphere. Life uses materials and energy, so it undergoes metabolism. Life reproduces, whether it's asexual or sexual, doesn't matter. Life is homeostatic, so maintaining that steady internal state. Life responds to stimuli. Think about if you didn't have the ability to respond to stimuli. So if you walked outside and it was really hot, but you couldn't sweat, that's not going to be very effective. Life forms ecosystems and life evolves. So life adapts and life changes over time. Taxonomy is concerned with identifying and grouping organisms. Usually we base it on evolutionary relationships. We get our data from the fossil records, from comparative anatomy, 
So we can look at different species and compare anatomically speaking and see common ancestry. We can analyze DNA through biochemical analysis and see how many um, proteins they have in common, for example. But taxonomy is changing all of the time. Why becomes the question. Because new technology needs to new knowledge, leads to new knowledge. What's happening is we are getting better and better microscopes, we are getting better techniques, and this is leading to new knowledge. So what we thought was similar before, we're examining it further and finding out that it's really not as similar as we thought. The Kingdom Protista is the best example. Protus, we thought they were all grouped together based on what they were, but we're analyzing them chemically and DNA speaking and finding out they have more and more differences. So now the Kingdom Protista is turning into Phylum Protista with a lot of kingdoms happening. So the taxon system used for naming is domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Domain is the largest category and most inclusive. Species is the narrowest category and least inclusive. You can use a mnemonic to remember it. Domineering King Philip came over for good soup. Or you can say, do kings play chess on fuzzy green stools? That's my favorite. So as I said, the broadest, most inclusive, they're more distantly related to the species, which is less inclusive and more closely related. So you go from most inclusive to less inclusive, general characteristics to specific characteristics, more distant to more close. So, offices. The domain would be North America, the kingdom would be United States, the phylum New Mexico, the class Lee County, the order, Hobbs, the city, the family, NMJC campus, and we're a family here at NMJC, the genus, Heidel Hall, and then the species, Heidel Hall 220, so to be specific. So here's another example using bears, if you want to look at that. So Linnaeus is accredited with the binomial nomenclature system. It's a two-part scientific name. It's the species name, which is the genus and the specific epitaph. So for example, Homo sapiens, Homo is the genus, sapiens is the specific epitaph. Latin is the language that's used because it's the universal language of scholars. It's considered a dead language, so it's not changing, but Binomial nomenclature is used to minimize confusion so that everybody knows what you're talking about. So humans, homo sapiens, are the same in the United States as they are in Australia, as they are in England. So confusion could happen because common names, species have different names. A locust, for example, could be a cicada or a grasshopper in some countries. So it really depends on what you're talking about, where you're talking about. So we use the Latin names to minimize that confusion and get rid of it. We have three domains today with four kingdoms. The three domains are Archaea, Bacteria, and Eukarya. The kingdoms are Protista, Fungi, Plantae, and Animalia. There are some similarities and some differences. So they all have cells, but some are prokaryotic, some are eukaryotic. They all have organization, but some are multicellular, some are unicellular. They all obtain nutrients, but some are autotrophic, some are heterotrophic. They all reproduce, but some are sexual, some are asexual. And they all respond to stimuli, but some are modal, some are non-modal. So prokaryotic organisms do not have a 
defined nucleus, and they do not have membrane-bound organelles. Eukaryotic cells do. They have a true nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. Unicellular is one cell, multicellular is multiple cells. Autotrophic make their own food, heterotrophic do not. Sexual reproduce with two parents, asexual is just one. Modal means they move, non-modal they don't. So as I said, prokaryotic, no nucleus or organelles, eukaryotic has one, unicellular one, multicellular is many, autotrophic makes its own food, heterotrophic does not. So heterotrophic organisms have to absorb or ingest their food. As you can see up top there, you have a basic cell and then you have prokaryotic versus eukaryotic. So all cells have the DNA, the cytoplasm, and a membrane but prokaryotic cells do not have a true nucleus or membrane bond organelles, eukaryotic cells do. So archaea are bacteria that live in extreme environments, so they'll be really hot environments, really salty, really acidic. Bacteria live almost everywhere. So bacteria are going to be things you've heard of, E. coli, Staph aureus, strep. Organization, they're both prokaryotic, they're both unicellular, and how they get their food varies. Sorry. Okay. Eukarya are eukaryotic organisms. The four kingdoms within eukarya are protista, fungi, plantae, and animals. Protista are the one I was talking about. They, we thought that they were more similar than we're finding out they actually are. Protista are made up of three groups, water and slime modes, which are fungi-like, algae, which are plant-like, and protozoa, which are animal-like. They're larger, more complex than the prokaryotic organisms. Again, eukaryotic. Protista are mostly unicellular. Fungi are mostly multicellular. The only exception is yeast. And plants and animals are multicellular. Protists vary on how they get their food. Fungi are heterotrophs that absorb their food. So what they do is they actually put digestive enzymes on their food and then absorb it through what are called the mycelia, which we'll talk about if you take the second semester. Plants are autotrophic via photosynthesis, so they make their own food through photosynthesis. And animals are heterotrophs that ingest their food. So some examples of fungi, mushrooms and yeast, plants, flowering plants, mosses, ferns, trees, of course, animals, we have sponges, worms, fishes, snakes, mammals, insects. Okay, so that is all for chapter one. I will see you later.